We are back and it is our episode of Startup Build uh, All in the Field, AWS and Agriculture Live. This season we have four shows that are focused on startups, all have unique ways that they're solving problems in agriculture. Today we are going to focus on two startups that are all about autonomy and bringing to life end-to-end -end solutions from the small end of the spectrum of working with bees to the bigger end of the spectrum of working with cattle. So be prepared for this episode to move you with innovation. Welcome to On The Build. Rachel, your jokes always crack me up. I'm so glad to co-host with you. Uh, this is always fun when we uh, get to see what you're going to come up with live. Um, so, <laughs> uh, for everybody who has uh, joining us today for the first time, very uh, glad to have you. I'm Karen Hildebrand. I'm our worldwide uh, technical lead for solutions architecture for the agriculture industry vertical. And what that actually means is that I get to work with all of the really cool, innovative customers that are working in agriculture. And uh, today, particularly, getting to share some of those really cool stories of ways that your food is being brought to you and connecting uh, the sustainability and autonomy uh, that's necessary to scale those solutions. So I co-host with Rachel. Rachel, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Bradshaw. I'm a worldwide go-to-market specialist for IoT, and I lead the agriculture vertical for IoT services. I am an agriculture fanatic. I am an IoT strategist, and I am usually unapologetic for very cheesy jokes that I make. So <laughs> um, I'm super excited about this episode, though, because for those of you that have watched in the past, you know how much sustainability and the environment is important to me. So we're talking to a company that is helping to save the bees, which is just so important for our environmental ecosystem and for the future of our food system. And then on the other hand, you also know I love food and we're talking to a company that is becoming more and more popular with dairy farmers. And, you know, dairy is one of my favorite things, milk, ice cream, don't forget the cheese. So super excited to jump in and speak with our guests today. I love it. And your cheesy jokes are always appreciated too. Uh, so let's get started with our field notes for today. So <laughs> Rachel, we talk a lot. I'm sorry, your jokes just still crack me up. Um, but we talk a lot about how rural and remote environments um, in moving towards autonomy, have to really think about how they can leverage IoT services. And I know IoT is your area of passion, but it's really helpful to kind of think about what are the ways in which um, customers' data can be uh, leveraged and brought in uh, to be meaningful and insightful. Yes, you know, I bring up IoT as much as I can. I wiggle it into the conversation, um, which is another reason why I'm so excited today because the two customers we're talking to both have IoT use cases. And IoT is all about capturing the data to make a change. And we always talk about if you knew the state of everything and could reason on top of that data, what would you do? And sometimes the biggest challenge for people is actually trying to figure out what would you do? What could you do differently to improve your business? Yeah, and I, as a SA, when we are talking to customers to kind of drill down further into that, we often are asking kind of what are the patterns that we would see as to why you would capture data at the edge or using IoT? And there's really three key patterns that we see uh, when you're thinking about what are the actions that you could change? You know, what are the ways that you would capture data more frequently? If you had those measurements more frequently, could you act more frequently? Um, if you were able to get that data with lower latency, uh, if that mm -hmm. data was actionable faster, what could you do differently? And then kind of third is what would you do if you had that additional data and combine it with your existing data sources? What would be that story if you were able to kind of enrich your data with more IoT? 
Right. That's exactly right. And customers like BeeWise, who we'll be speaking to today, is a great example of the first you mentioned. Right now, beekeepers have to drive, well, historically, they have to drive to their hives to be able to check in and to know the health of their colony and to be able to capture data. And so BeeWise was able to think about how to solve this problem of knowing what's going on with your colony without actually being present um, using IoT and AI and ML and how do robotics come into play without you physically being there. So it will be really interesting to see what they have to say. Yeah, that, that's what's really exciting about hearing our customer stories. And, you know, the use case that we hear often when we're talking right now in reducing latency um, is because of the changing environment that people are in right now. And so we hear that a lot from food processors who are having to change the way their lines operate and the social distance that has to be maintained between employees and ways that they are able to bring that uh, to bear so that they can continue to uh, do the processing operations operations that are so important to our food uh, supply chain. And so uh, we have uh, solutions out that customers have built, but they also then make them available on the AWS marketplace for other customers to deploy. And so uh, we've seen uh, companies and partners like uh, Module who have built uh, and used their uh, safety belt uh, that has existed for a while, but really thought about how that could be leveraged to kind of send that information in real time so that you can not only maintain social distance, but there can be uh, like a quick and easy way to notify the employee, help kind of with that training because the lines are all changing right now anyway. So being able to have that uh, low latency, auto-correcting kind of self-correcting behavior is really helpful. Yeah, I, I think everyone agrees. It's been a really interesting year for many of us as we've encountered changes to our daily lives, but it's been really amazing you know, to watch our customers from a business perspective as, as well um, and how they're changing their businesses and how they're leveraging IoT in order to effectively implement those changes. And uh, they're looking at how IoT data can be leveraged along with existing data to build the what if scenarios out and to build an ensemble of forecasts to react to various scenarios because, uh, you know, as people say all the time, we're in pre unprecedented times. And so now people are starting to think about the what what if and, and how do I react if this were to ever occur again or what if something else happens? And it's been really interesting from the supply chain shocks uh, this year to the long term supply chain visibility from, say, cow to cheese to yogurt to milk or, you know, me myself, I partake in a milk delivery service. So how do you track visibility on that? Right. And actually, you know, this kind of leads me into one of my favorite new services. And so I, this is not like a service plug, but this service makes me super excited because I've led data science teams and those that are trying to do forecasting for a, probably more years than I should say, but definitely 10 years. And uh, so when we're trying to build those forecasting models or those scenario building uh, types of things using a service like Amazon uh, Augmented AI or Amazon AI is the kind of short way that people are referring to it, allows you to have that human in the loop so that they can provide their insight and that can go right back into your machine learning model. So it's a really cool way to continue to leverage the human insight and the human knowledge uh, and capture that in ways that can be encoded and used in your machine learning models. So uh, one of my favorite new services for all of those that you're watching, I hope that you go and actually go check it out after, uh, stay on the stream for now. <laughs> Way to sneak in a few more services. You're just like me. I'm always trying to sneak in IoT, and that was a great way to sneak in a few more very cool services that we offer at AWS. Um, but enough about us chit-chatting. Why don't we go ahead and jump into the show, and let's introduce our first guest, Saar, joining us all the way from Israel. Awesome. Rachel, Karen, Welcome. thank you for... Oh, sorry, yeah, I spoke Karen. over you. Welcome. <laughs> Glad that you're here. Uh, we great. Why don't you do an introduction of yourself and then tell us a little bit about BeWise. So Rachel, Karen, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Star from oh. BeWise. BeWise is a three-year-old company out of Israel, and we do one thing and one thing only. We provide robotic beehives to save the bees. Uh, let me just provide you guys a little bit of context to understand why we do these things. 75% of all vegetable, fruit, seeds, and nuts in the world are pollinated by bees. 
That's for 7.5 billion people globally. Things like tomatoes, cucumbers, apples, almonds, uh, uh, avocado, cotton, coffee. All right, now I have your attention. Um, so these are <laughs> pollinated by bees. But like in every good story, there's a twist. And in our case, the twist is we're losing our bees. We're losing about 40% of the bees globally every single year. Doesn't matter where you are in the US, in Israel, in Europe, or in China, you're going to lose about 40% of your bees every single year. Yeah, that's just amazing to me. I know until I started working with BeeWise, I had no idea that more than 75% of fruits and vegetables and seeds and nuts were pollinated by bees. And, and now I've done a ton of research into it, of course. And I mean, I knew we had to save the bees. I knew that was impactful to our environment, but I didn't know the stats behind it. Yeah, I'd agree. Like I've heard a colony collapse before we started working together, but to hear that it's 40%, you know, really hits home. And I think it's those kinds of stats that are really impactful in figuring out how can we make sure that uh, there's technology solutions uh, that can help make sure that we have bees for the important work that they do for the rest of our agricultural products. Yeah, Sar, so, so maybe along those lines, can you share with us, how do you keep a colony healthy using BeeWise? So there's a variety of reasons why bees are collapsing or colonies are collapsing from uh, uh, climate change to pesticides, disease, pests. And the other thing is that beekeepers are not able to treat their hives at scale in real time. Meaning that if you have a thousand hives and above, if you're a commercial beekeeper, you can only visit your hives every once every few weeks and then realize what's going on there and treat them. So what we've developed is a device that actually houses these hives. There's robotics in the center and through computer vision, the robotics constantly monitor the hives. They identify what are the needs of the bees, whether it be forage, food, water, whether it's too hot or too cold, whether there's a disease or a pest. And then the robotic system actually treats the bees in real time in the field. And I think that's the cool thing. Like you actually had to physically build a bee home, but then you also had to determine the technology that you were going to put inside it. And, you know, I am a sucker for reference architectures. So uh, would you mind walking us through your reference architecture and, and telling us a little bit more about what you build from a technology standpoint? Yeah, so we'll take, uh, this is a good example of one uh, use case. In this specific case, it's uh, our image processing system. So we have computer vision, the robot takes pictures, and then we have to convert that picture into data so that there's another neural network that identifies the issue. So if you start from the top left and kind of go all the way down to the bottom left, uh, uh, a customer comes in, they want to see a hive or they want to see what's going on, one of the beekeepers, and that sends a request into the AWS system through the IoT system uh, uh, to actually scan the hive. We scan the hives, we send the information, the actual photos, the raw data up into the cloud and through Lambdas and, and SageMaker and AI ML, we're able to actually analyze in real time and provide the beekeeper an analysis of what is going on in their hives. Remember that before this beekeeper, like Rachel said, you had to drive for a few hours into the field and until you don't open the hood, you don't know what's going on under the hood, right? In our case, we give them real-time visibility through a relatively simple process. And I say simple, it doesn't look simple, but it's simple because all the integration and all the connections are done through under one roof, the AWS system, like I said, from IoT through ML, AI, and back to the customer, providing real critical value for the first time in history to beekeepers to be able to remotely uh, treat their bees. Yeah, I just think this is so cool. I mean, of course I'm biased because anything that includes IoT, I think it's so cool, but just because the impact this has. <laughs> I have to ask, so if the hive is, the beehive is autonomous, how do you ensure that it continues to operate if it goes offline? Do you have backup power or is there data persistence or, or what do you do? So uh, I can tell you all the nitty gritties, but, but in essence, uh, uh, being an AWS shop, we use every AWS uh, 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 service possible, and especially IoT. And that helps us kind of build a multi-layer service where a lot of the data is captured 
you know, in the field, in the device, and we wait until there's connectivity. In terms of power, it's a self-sustainable system. It's solar powered. And so uh, um, we really don't, it doesn't really bother us if there is connectivity at some point uh, or not. Whenever there is, we can push the data outwards into the cloud, and then we do all the data processing. It, you know, for beekeepers today, the resolution of data, the real time of the data is three weeks old, right? Once every three weeks when they get to the hive. In our case, even if we're an hour late, it's a significant improvement uh, uh, versus what they get today. And I think you've talked uh, like a couple times today here about um, how you've really used a pretty complete tech stack from AWS. And you worked with our startup SA that's based out of Israel, David. So shout out to David. Um, but how did your team determine, you know, what was going to be part of your tech stack and, you know, what did what uh, onboarding or how hard was that to get started? I'll, I'll, I'll answer you from a little a different angle from more of a business angle. For me, what's yeah. more important than anything else is kind of being out in the market as soon as possible. So, you know, we try and use and leverage every possible service, every possible tool out there just to kind of speed time to market. And so uh, you guys know this, the AWS system, we know David well, but we don't really have to know David or the AWS team. It's so uh, uh, easy to use, plug and play, and the services are actually well integrated. You know, it, it, it would have been really bad if there were a lot of services that didn't speak well to each other. But for us, everywhere we can plug an AWS service to uh, uh, speed our time to market, there's no questions asked. We will look for that service and do it. Uh, and so you saw through that one image processing uh, 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 system, there's a lot of services involved, but there wasn't a lot of time involved in setting that up. And there isn't a lot of time and cost involved in making that run properly. I think that it was like, really it sounded like a commercial, but that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, that was spot on. That was awesome. Now, we've iterated on this point a couple of times, Sar, about how um, the bees are so important to our environment. And clearly, your innovation here is going to make a difference in the world. But can you dive a little bit deeper on that? Tell us how BeeWise is making an impact. So, first of all, we are here to save the bees. Every hire we hire to the company, that's what they come with. We don't hire people that don't say this through the interview process. So this is kind of in our DNA, saving the bees. We are a for-profit company. So we're, you know, we're trying to make money and sell these devices and these services. But first and foremost, we are successful for saving the bees. And so these things are always aligned. There's, a never, there's never a conflict of interest, meaning that the more devices out in the field, operation, operational, and providing value to our customers, the more money we make and the more bees are saved. Like I said, these lines are forever parallel, never cross each other. And so as we scale, we will save more bees and that will go on and on forever. So we're, we're very happy that, you know, uh, uh, as we do well, we're doing some good at the same time. And that should I be a trending hashtag. Yeah, save the bees. for sure. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I think that's so true. And, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, how important it is for BeeWise in terms of, you know, what AI and ML are bringing forward. How much uh, of what you've built from an AI and ML, ML standpoint uh, do you really feel is changing agriculture overall? So Karen, let me give you some context. In our device, there's 24 hives. That equates to a million bees. So every single device houses a million bees. Inside the device, we monitor all those bees in real time. We monitor the hives, the bees, the colonies. That's a lot of information. That's, that's humongous amounts of information that are being processed, again, through IoT into our ML AI uh, service in the cloud. And so uh, uh, analyzing all that data, identifying things in such an intimate environment. I mean, biological models are perfect for AI because they're so unpredictable, chaotic, right? A million bees, think about how that works. And so uh, uh, I, I like to think about it as the new agricultural revolution, because the idea here is that uh, uh, we see AI in many, many areas. We see AI in cybersecurity, we see AI in, 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 in e-commerce, and we see improvements that AI bring to our day-to-day -day lives. 
when you take AI and you apply it in a traditional industries, such as uh, uh, um, you know beekeeping or bees or, or, or agriculture in general, the yields, the improvement, the outcome is incredible. We were blown away. We, we never predicted that we'd have such amazing results by applying AI to this laggard industry. So it is for me the new agricultural revolution. It's the AI revolution. Uh, and I'm very happy to partake in that revolution. Absolutely. I think you just gave me goosebumps of like, that's the reason that I think a lot of us are, are working in this industry. So uh, it's it's great to be a part of what the potential is and how we protect our food supply and, and increase it as we need to. Cool. I agree. I agree. Karen and I consider ourselves revolutionists as well, because we do want to help push the agriculture industry in the direction of the, the revolution. So I completely agree. Um, now, Sar, you have been super humble. BeWise has been super humble, but we would be really remiss not to mention some of the success or the awards you guys have won. So I did want to at least shout out with a cool visual that's going to come up on some of the challenges you've won. And I know this is only a small segment because Karen and I do research and we just want to say congratulations. Yeah, it's really awesome. And I know we don't want to make you humble brag, but this was really cool um, <laughs> to see all of the uh, awards and the participation in different challenges that uh, you've been part of. So I wanted to call that out. Um, and Rachel, you know how terrible I am at doing handles. So we are going to go <laughs> to the customer like questions or the viewer segment, but I am throwing it to you because I totally butchered all of the handles last time. So it's on you. <laughs> So now it's my time to butcher the handles. Thank you. Um, so we do have a question from Nafitz949. And sorry, I think we briefly talked about this earlier, but how do you deal with rural areas with poor connectivity? So we have in our device, we have uh, all the bands of connectivity, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, anything we can. And also these devices are interconnected to one to the other. So you might not be connected to the, to the network, but you might be uh, not too far from the next device. And so they can transfer data one to the other. And then the first one that is connected can push all that to the cloud. Okay, great. Now we have another question from Navidi Ola. Hopefully I said that right. Um, and you briefly talked about your reference architecture, but just to reiterate, how is BeWise connected to AWS? Is it just hosting AI in instances, et cetera? So we have, we try and, like I said, we try and leverage every AWS service we can. So there's, there's like uh, services for almost anything we need. It starts with the actual device. Inside the device, we have a lot of uh, uh, computing power that uses mostly IoT for uh, security, safety, connectivity, uh, some crunching of the information, data storage, data analysis, and so on. And so we use that. On the cloud, right, we use the S3, EC3, obviously. We use SageMaker to train our AI. There's a lot of services we use. And honestly, we're kind of on the lookout. Every time there's a new AWS service, we try and play with it and, and tinker with it to see, can that help us save time, save money, make the process more uh, efficient, more secure. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the full list of services. I think it's like, I mean, you guys probably should know better, Karen and Rachel, but, but I think it's a long list of services. And hopefully, you know, it will grow longer because as we use more services, we're the one benefiting. So you guys are really empowering the, the, the agriculture revolution. You do it through software and we're the users of that software. Oh, that was great. Well, that's all the questions we have right now. Thank you so much for joining us and for your time. I know that I will talk to you later, but this was, it always fascinates me talking to BeWise and to you, of course, Sar. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sar. All right, now we can transition into our next guest. I'm super excited to introduce Terry from Catalai. Hey, Terry. <laughs> Hi, guys. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks Here. so much for joining us. Now, um, I love that you describe yourself as a son of a dairy farmer, but you've also successfully exited 
other startups. So why don't you just tell the audience a little bit about yourself and give a little bit of background? Yeah, sure thing. So yeah, I grew up in a dairy farm, a, a small dairy farm in Ireland, and I was the second son. So uh, I had to be sent out to fend for myself. So I was sent off to college where I studied engineering. And then I spent the next eight years working in the telecoms world. So I worked it for I worked in Silicon Valley, I worked in Beijing, I worked in Ottawa. But our focus with those companies, and this was the mid 90s, was on cloud computing and uh, how we could build cloud computing applications. Now this was of course before the time of Amazon. And <laughs> so we had to learn from, from first principles how, how to develop applications. So in 2004, I applied that knowledge of building cloud applications to the livestock industry and founded what was at the time the world's first software as a service for managing livestock. So I grew that up over the next 10 years until we we're managing about 4 million animals worldwide. And I sold it in 2015, exiting successfully in March of last year. So the one that we all face in this industry is how we get better data from farmers about their livestock. We all need good data to help to prove genetics, improve efficiencies. But more and most importantly is monitoring and improving animal welfare. As an industry, we're under a lot of pressure from the alternative protein. So we need to be able to demonstrate that our animals are well cared for and well looked after. So how do we do that? So what we do is we set up two dimensional security cameras. These security cameras are mounted um, either side uh, at the entrance point and the exit point of a milking parlor. We pull that footage up into the Amazon cloud where we run, um, we run neural networks on that footage to segment out the cows, identify them, and to derive specific insights that are useful to the farmers, such as mobility score, lameness levels, estrus activity, etc. Yeah, I find this super interesting. And I mean, one, because we love technology here, but two, just the impact you're having out with dairy farmers, uh, you know, across, well, across the globe, I'm sure. Um, can you provide a bit more information on the, what what does the farmer do with the insights that you provide? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we provide a range of insights. Um, one of the most important ones is the, the, the mobility scoring of, of each individual cow. One of the big issues that uh, we as an industry face is lameness levels and dairies. Now, it's partially um, a welfare issue because you know we, we get pressure from the vegans that say our animals are lame on the dairy, but also it's it, it's a bottom line issue as well. So, so this is a, a double bottom line issue for the farmer. Uh, so if they can improve their lameness levels, they can make more money and their animals are happier. So what we do is we can analyze each individual cow and then we direct the farmer as to which cow has is having problems with their feet. The farmers can treat the animals, the animal becomes better, the animal's happier, and it also produces more uh, produces more milk. So it's, it's everybody's happy as a result of that. A win-win for all, I like it. Absolutely. And uh, from a tech standpoint, I know we're gonna bring in uh, Adam, who is your CTO. Hopefully uh, he'll join in here. Oh, I see the screen, so that's perfect. So Adam, <laughs> welcome, thanks for joining us today. Could you give us just a, a brief intro of who you are and then I'll kind of add the technical questions on top of that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, so my background is very uh, complementary to Terry's. So nothing really to do with ag agriculture other than a, a passion for animal welfare. But but my background is really in health tech. So I've spent the past sort of 12 years of my career focusing on in digital pathology. So. Um, and, and within that space, focusing on artificial intelligence and using that in order to do tumor and cancer detection. Um, so it was it was brilliant being able to take a lot of those um, insights and technologies and methodologies and be able to apply them into the agriculture space um, with the help of, of Amazon. So, yeah, it was uh, really good. Very cool. Like we talk a lot at Amazon about day one and it always being day one here um, and making decisions based on that. Could you tell us a little bit about what day one looked like at Cadillac and uh, what problem were you trying to solve? And from a tech standpoint, uh, what did that look like? Yeah, yeah so so day, day one was, um, yeah, it was exciting to start with. Um, but with my background uh, using Amazon Web Services before, uh, with Terry's background having you know come from a dairy farm, already having cameras set up on the dairy farm, um, we were able to use a lot of the Amazon Web Services to get the data up quickly, uh, be able to process it quickly, and generate some insights. Uh, Terry's family farm really within the first week um, of of 
being up and running. Um, so that was, that was, yeah, really effective. That's cool. Within a week, that is pretty amazing. Um, Within a week, yeah. 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 Can you tell us, like, obviously you've built a lot since, you know, day one or day seven. Uh, what does your reference architecture look like now? Could you kind of talk us through kind of what you've built so far and maybe some of the services that you're leveraging? Yeah. So so at Catalyze, we really think of it as a, as a data pipeline. So all of the data is, all, is on the farm. Uh, we would use a, an IP camera to capture the footage. Um, and then during milking time, so farmers have really strict milking times that when the animals come in to get milk, we are able to uh, contact the camera, um, ingress all that footage up um, from the farm um, into, into S3, um, and then using um, Amazon SNS and Lambda, then kick off a, a number of ML jobs in parallel to process all of those videos, process all of those cows. Um, then we can... Uh, compute all that information, push it into our insights pillar. So you can sort of see the, our four pillars there, the ingress, the analysis, the insights. That insights prov provides some really quick read models. So rather than having to parse, the, you know, the farmer doesn't want to have to work all the way through all of that data. So we, we boil that down into the real key insights that's appropriate for them and to allow them to, to get value out of their, their farm and, and their animals. And then we can serve that up to them in a, a mobile friendly way using um, Amazon Cognito and uh, CloudFront, um, along with a React website hosted directly on S3. Super cool. That's a quick way to get them their insights. That's that's what we want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <Huge impact. laughs> um, could you tell us a little bit, like, I know you've built a number of algorithms and you talked a little bit about that pillar. Um, I think there's a visual here that you were able to sh share with us about kind of what that looks like for the farmer as they're interacting. Yeah, so the, the platform's not just about getting data through the pipeline as quickly as possible, uh, but once we get it up there, we want to run as many algorithms as possible. So it's not just about sort of you know, one one algorithm to rule them all, but you know, we'll have, we have an algorithm for cow detection and tracking, uh, for identification, so being able to um, identify which one of these uh, animals, you know, you know, which one it is, who, 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 is that, who is that cow, their mobility, um, their body condition score. So for, for every animal on screen there, you, you imagine that's moving across the camera, being able to pick it out, know who it is, know their medical history, and be able to you know, collate all that together and pass that down to the farmer um, in, a, in, a really quick, in a really quick way. You know, if you imagine a farmer's got a lot of animals, they've got to have even a web app that allows them to digest the important bits of information as quickly as possible. Yeah, exactly. Their primary purpose is on the actual dairy, not on uh, trying to digest and figure out what actions to take. So I think that's a really cool um, way of looking at that and, and providing really distilled actions. Sorry, Rachel, yeah, and I cut along, you off. No, no, no. I think you it was a perfect segue because along those lines, because dairy farmers are focused on their dairy and actually producing more, we do hear a lot of times from customers on, well, I don't even know where to start with device and hardware selection. So when you guys were looking at doing Catalyze, how did you decide on the hardware? Yeah, so for us, we really had you know, a couple of, of key ambitions, um, and one of the main ones was to have the minimum possible footprint on the farm. Uh, so there, there are a lot of other ways to generate insights um, from dairy animals on farm, but it all involves you know, a lot of devices, every animal having its own device, where we want to take a very different approach so that it's almost uh, you know, silent analysis. It, it goes on in the farm. The farmer doesn't have to worry about it, and, and it really brings that true autonomy or aut autonomousness it, to the farm. Um, so yeah, we wanted to pick an IP camera, something that was quick to ingest the, the, the data um, and wouldn't, um, wouldn't be in the way. I think that's, that's a really good way of thinking about that. Like how do you minimize as many of the blockers as possible? Um, but there might be still more. Maybe are there any blockers that you still see as challenges that you need to overcome um, or additional things that uh, you're looking at in order to kind of solve for the blockers that you're seeing in, in these dairy barns? 
Um, sure, yeah. I think Saur mentioned it uh, previously in his his session as well. But uh, internet access and connectivity is really the the key one for the cloud. You know, that's how you get anything from from on premise up up to the cloud. Uh, so for us at the moment, we're we're quite lucky. We can we can in ingress quite a lot of data um, through the pipes that we have available to us. But at some stage, there there comes a, a decision where it's it's more effective or cheaper to bring the compute to the data rather than having to bring the data up to the compute. Um, but but we're quite lucky, I suppose, with, with AWS that there are quite a lot of offerings already there to allow us to quickly actually just port our, our platform on an IoT device um, on farm again with quite a minimum footprint uh, rather than having to, to send a lot of hardware down. I always love to hear about IoT. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'm not sure if it'd be Adam or Terry, maybe Terry might be able to answer this question, but in a changing world, Catalai has additional opportunities that it enables like remote vet and animal welfare traceability and verification of processes. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you enable this type of uh, animal welfare? Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, the, the, the dairy farmer is, is a very, very important piece of an entire supply chain. So you have, people, genetics, nutrition, and health company providing products into the farm. And then you have retailers and processors bringing those uh, products from the farm uh, into the consumer. And one of the issues that's very important to the retailer as they communicate with the consumer is animal welfare. So what we can do with obviously the farmer's permission is we can share data along the chain right down to the retailer and potentially all the way through to the consumer so that they know whenever they, they, they buy a, a liter of milk from from their particular retailer that those cows that have produced this milk have led a happy life. Um, so that, that's very important to us. And also when you think about downstream, so you've got, you've got people that are concerned with, with uh, animal illness and et cetera. We can use our, our technology, our insights to diagnose any issues that, that, that may be coming up with, with the animals. With the, a really, uh, one of our big objectives is, is to reduce antibiotic usage on the farm. So rather than the, the blanket application of, of uh, antibiotics, we can help isolate and identify particular animals that might um, that, that might need that treatment rather than the, the, than the farmer applying it uh, right right across the herd or to particular groups of animals. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And certainly from a kind of a big animal vet standpoint, being able to scale their capabilities uh, makes a lot of sense as well because of, you know, the rural and remote nature of these uh, operations. And, and certainly cows uh, don't all get sick at a convenient time. So this is a really unique situation. I know you've started, sorry, with uh, particularly cattle um, because obviously it's right in your name uh, and dairy cattle. Are you planning on expanding it all to other types of livestock? Uh, I'm thinking, obviously, from a tech stack standpoint, that's totally possible, but we'd love to hear a little bit more about what you're thinking. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever we set out on this journey, we really wanted to be a full livestock um, AI monitoring system. So uh, we chose dairy to start with uh, because, well, I knew the industry, having my previous business, haven't been involved in that. Um, so uh, we, we, we want to use that as our, our, as our beachhead market. Uh, but we're just in the process of raising three million dollars uh, with venture capital and that's going to allow us to scale our team so right now we've got nine people on the team we want to double that to 18 uh, we want to start looking into the the beef world first of all so we're, we're looking at some really interesting applications of our technology uh, for predicting when the right time is to harvest beef cattle or to monitor brd and the within feedlots uh, again using that to diagnose if an animal is ill uh, or, and needs treatment. We want to look at swine. Swine's a big issue. We want to be able to to monitor what's ha what's happening to pigs and poultry as well. Poultry is very interesting because it's more about the swirling of the of the little chicks as they <laughs> as they exist in the barn. But it's it's very um, it's it, it's very it fits machine vision very well. Those types of solutions. And again, we we built our pipeline. We built our platform that enables us to develop more and more insights and then deploy these insights to more and more potential customers. No, that's great. Well, let's go ahead and turn to the chat to see if we have any questions at this time. So we do. Billy Tim 84 has a question and it's, does Catalyze allow the farmer to know when the cow is in heat? 
That's a really good question because yes, <laughs> we uh, <laughs> one of our first insights uh, that in fact Adam was referring to on, on my family farm was uh, the use of what they, these little strips, these little scratch cards that sit in the back of uh, that sit in the cow's back and tell you whenever she's she's ready for breeding. So we we, we did some development with that. Um, so yeah, Easter text is a big part of what we do. I think we want to go beyond having to read strips, uh, and I think we want to look for other insights. So. Uh, in terms of our feature set, our, our first feature that we're delivering will be mobility score, which is the, the lameness. Uh, next, we look into body condition score, but certainly estrus detection would, would, is definitely up there uh, and what we want to achieve. Fantastic. I feel like that has the joke of the original AI built right into it. So uh, appreciate your sharing that one. <laughs> Let's see if there's any other questions. Oh, so we do have a question from our own narr our moderator. I was going to call him a narrator. Uh, moderator and ag tech specialist, Nathan. And his question is, so our cattle hide patterns like snowflakes where no two are exactly the same? That's a good question. I'm going to get like, Adam <laughs> answer that one. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I think what, what we've seen is that, uh, you know, whenever, whenever humans sort of look at the pattern, you sort of look at it and they all look quite different, um, but not all animals have a pattern. So that automatically sort of wipes that out. So, uh, you, you tend to also find that some of the animals that are related, um, or very closely related have similar patterns as well. So, so there are traits in the patterns that, that you can see. Um, our, our algorithms look beyond just the pattern in order to identify each of each of the animals. Um, if only it was as easy as, as the simple patterns, then it would make my job a lot easier as well. <laughs> well I think that's a great answer. <laughs> well, it doesn't appear that we have any more questions at this time. So at this time, we'll just say thank you so much for joining us, Terry and Adam. It's always great chatting with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. I love hearing our customers share their stories. I think that might actually be my favorite part of the job is hearing what everybody's building that's like really new and innovative and, and ways that they're approaching it by really just like deeply understanding the customer. And, uh, you know, both Terry and Sarah and Adam, huge thanks, obviously, for joining us and sharing that. No, I agree. I feel like that is definitely one of my favorite parts of the job, seeing all the cool innovation that's coming out and thinking, wow, I would have never in a million years thought I'd see the day, but we are seeing the day and it's it's really neat. Uh, speaking of favorite part of job, though, now it's time for one of my favorite segments, and that is our field tips and tricks segment. So, okay, Karen. We have all kinds of crazy conversations between shows and <laughs> chat IMs. Um, so today's tips and tricks is actually based on one of those conversations. We were talking recently about how harvest is going in the Midwest, if you recall, and as the soy and corn crops are being harvested and what's going on there. And you went full nerd mode on me <laughs> and said, let's just deploy an AI driven social media dashboard for hashtag ads. Ag Twitter, like simple. <laughs> I will totally admit that I did that. And you were like, okay, if you can do that, go for it. And I was like, oh, sure. It's a solution that's already pre-built and it's a cloud formation template. And then you were like, you nerded out for a few minutes there. So anyway, uh, I will talk you through the reference architecture because I'm sure everybody else would like to know what was already built. So if you want to pull up the reference architecture, I am turning to the side here so that I can see it. Oh, small delay in our reference architecture coming up. I know, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. There you okay, go. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, 
I literally, this is a cloud formation template. It's a pre-built solution. Nathan's going to drop it in the chat. So if you want to do this, there's going to be a challenge part that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But in terms of what it actually does from a cloud formation template, uh, as you deploy this, it takes about five minutes to build. You will need a few things, uh, and those are in the prerequisites that you'll see in the implementation guide, like um, the API keys from Twitter and uh, your private key for your EC2 instance. Um, that being said, uh, we ingest the data uh, using Kinesis Data Firehose as part of the actual CloudFormation template. You can choose which hashtags you want to include. So I was showing Rachel this and I went very nerdy because it was happy. It was National Farmers Day and then I did egg Twitter um, and I did a few other terms. But uh, so I chose the ones that I wanted to include. Um, and then it uses S3 buckets uh, and processes that data. There's Lambda functions that are included to do that. The thing that's the really coolest, uh, I think, is that I was able to pull in um, tweets that were from a different language. So I was able to pull in uh, five different languages. You'll see in the template um, that there is a mapping table that builds because the Twitter languages are not all the same as the way that we map those in terms of uh, language codes. So you'll see that that's also pre-built in the CloudFormation template. But Translate translates the tweets and then Comprehend takes those tweets and then does a sentiment analysis. So we can see See, you know, positive, negative, neutral, those kinds of cool things about sentiment. And then I could query it all and see kind of what was the trends um, using Amazon Athena. And then, because I'm super nerdy, I went and built a dashboard uh, with Amazon QuickSight. Um, so that's kind of the last step is actually visualizing that so that we can fully nerd out together and you can see what I'm seeing. I know I tease you all the time about going tech nerd on me, but you know deep down I'm just jealous because I love getting into technical discussions with you and learning more and more about how we can do these types of things. So you pre-built this cloud, used a cloud formation template to deploy it. Um, so what does QuickSight actually allow us to creatively look at? Okay, so the I will fully say I did not build the CloudFormation template. It was existing. However, I did change the QuickSight dashboard to be specific to what I thought we would want to be talking about. And I did put in there the all in the field tweets. So anybody that uh, tweets today, please do so. If you hashtag us, it will pull into my new dashboard. Um, and I'm going to share that next time. However, we also wanted to say that our challenge, which we always have a make an impact challenge, we wanted to extend this CloudFormation template and really ask you, what would you build into an AI-driven social media dashboard that's related to agriculture? And if you're willing to share it, hashtag all in the field, and we'll be able to put those on our upcoming episode to see what you were able to build by pulling in specific hashtags. I'm excited to see what people end up doing. I can't wait till our next episode to see. <laughs> so get creative uh, and take a shot. <laughs> well, that brings absolutely. us to the end. This almost never happens. We are on time for once. Uh, you all out there might be a little sad that we're on time for once. You want more time with us and we get it, but we are wrapping up. <laughs> a big shout out to our moderators, Nathan and Matt, who are answering any questions that come into the chat. Uh, Nathan sh should be sharing resources, so make sure you take a look at the chat stream and um, as always, uh, look for the description area where the content is posted. If you have ideas for episodes or topics you want us to talk about or cover or any make an impact challenge that you have, uh, let us know, hashtag all in the field. Thanks again for joining us and, and special thanks to Sar and Terry and Adam as well. I'm Rachel. Absolutely. And thanks, Rachel. We'll be back on October 29th. So we'd love to have you join us for that episode. It's going to be all about geospatial pipelines and geospatial processing. And uh, we have some special guests from our AWS Registry of Open Data and a couple customers who are going to share how they have built geospatial pipelines and how they're making an impact. Uh, so join us then. And again, thanks for your time today. Uh, and make sure that you tweet us if there's any questions you have afterwards. Thanks everybody. Yeah. That's all. Thanks everyone. We'll see you again.